Hello and welcome to this episode of Human Rights Magazine. My name is Derek McCush. President Museveni of Uganda has retained power since 1986, using violence, arrests, and media suppression to maintain the military dictatorship. In this episode of Human Rights Magazine, Nkwanzi Manage talks with experts about dynamics of politics and elections in Uganda and how Museveni has successfully kept power for decades. If you do not have shared truth, then anyone can say election is rigged and they have they refuse to accept the, the elections, which makes any government that comes into power illegitimate in the eyes of those, that particular segment of society. What the effects of that will be on liberal democracies, I do not know. On January 14, 2021, Ugandan citizens went to the polls and voted for the country's next president in a general election. While 11 candidates stood, the competition remained fierce between Yoweri Museveni, the incumbent president who had been in power since 1986, and Robert Sentamu, also known by stage name Bobby Wine, an up-and-coming musician turned political figure. The 2021 general elections were characterized by widespread violence, arrests, detentions, riots, and media suppression, and were also accompanied by a record low voter turnout of 57%. Museveni eventually claimed victory in what some of his supporters referred to as the most peaceful election since Uganda's independence in 1962, while Wine maintained that the election season had resulted in the arrest of nearly 3,000 of his supporters and campaign teams since November 2020. As the Ugandan raised in the diaspora, I was curious about the political situation of the country, especially considering the re-election of President Museveni. I sought to understand what reality entailed for those living in Uganda simply looking to cast a ballot, most of whom have never known a leader other than Museveni. Eager to learn from Ugandan professionals and activists living in the country and abroad, I attempted to understand why the country faced such unprecedented levels of political suppression and intimidation, why such violence is recurring every election season, and what the international response, if any, has been to what seems like a dire political situation. I answer all these questions and more in the following episode of Human Rights Magazine. I first spoke with Stephen Kabuye, a human rights activist from Kampala, Uganda. He witnessed the November riots that arose in Luka, a district in eastern Uganda where 54 people were shot and 22 were killed in the unrest. I wanted to learn about his experience in the Luka riots and what it meant to navigate the turbulent political climate as a young Ugandan who has never known a president other than Museveni. I'm Stephen Kabuye, age 25. I'm a human rights activist from Kampala, Uganda. I understand that there were many arbitrary arrests that took place around election season. What was your experience with that? A lot of people lost their lives. A lot of people are still now in jail. We've seen, we've seen petitions. We've seen people being brought to court every time. Last time they were put on treason charges. These people were arrested in 2021. They were campaigning with Bobby Wine. They are still held in, they are still held in prison. They are bring, being brought, brought to, uh, to, to, to martial courts as if they are, they, are, they, are, they are soldiers. Last time when they decided to raise the voice against being brought and they, haven't, they, are not given, they are not given bail, they decided to put treason charges on them. These people committed nothing. They committed no crime. They just supported the opposition. That's their crime. We have a lot of people like Olivia Lutaya. Olivia Lutaya is a mother with two children. The crime she committed was supporting Bobby Wine. She's still in prison. We have a lot of them. John Bosco Chivalama, no one knows where he is right now. But the Prime Minister of Uganda said she knew where Bosco Chivalama was. Up now, she doesn't disclose the location. It's now three years. Ever since, she, ever since he was abducted, what's the crime? Supporting the opposition is the crime. Could you tell me a little bit more about the November riots? So we are in town and then the violence breaks out and then we are trying to get out of town. So my hands are up. 
showing them that I'm unarmed, I'm just trying to go home. All of a sudden, guy packs a tow rig, gets a gun out of the boat, starts shooting. In the next minute, I just saw the boy that was in front of me. In fact, I think he was something like 17, if he was, according to my estimation. He fell down, died there of a sudden. Just imagine the trauma. And the president came out and said they were secret bullets. Imagine, secret bullets. And everyone believed that thing. We saw videos merging online where people were being shot. Two ladies were shot beside the road by a convoy that was moving. Let's let, leave alone that. We saw, we have Kamiat. Kamiat was a food vendor in town. She was shot while vending her food. Right now, we don't know the culprits that shot Kamiat. On camera, the cameras go that got Kamiat is shooting. She wasn't in the violence. We have many people that died that wasn't in the violence. And the president came out and said, those were citra bullets. Imagine, imagine the people that lost their lives in those in the situation, the situation where he's allowed to have a lot of people come on his campaign trail, but the opponents ain't allowed. You just you, you just talk, talk about it and you feel like, you know, is this really the Africa we really desire or the Africa we really love to embrace? I then spoke to Pius Jadwar a political activist from Kampala who worked on the campaign trail alongside Bobby Wine. I wanted to learn about the arrests that took place in the weeks leading up to, during, and after the elections. Wine was under house arrest while the election results were announced, but this suppression of the opposition was not uniquely reserved for political figures. Take Busoga One, for example, a radio station which broadcasted the arrest of opposition leader Bobby Wine. It was taken off the air. I was curious about his experience as a polling agent on election day and wanted to learn about any challenges that polling agents faced on the ground. So uh, my name is Pas Jadwa. I do come from Uganda and I am one of the oppressed Ugandans out of the 42 million Ugandans who are living in this country. Uh, there are a lot of Ugandans who are oppressed, but they do not have that voice to speak out. So I came out as an human being to do fight for them. Now, Pius, what was your experience with arbitrary arrests during the election season? One thing was uh, every polling agent across the country uh, was arrested. Two, uh, if at all they, uh, uh, they, they found you, you know, uh, uh, having an affiliation to the NUP, the party, that I do subscribe to. Either you are you're being kidnapped or you are going to be arrested or they are going to just bullet you. Simple as that. Do you understand? So uh, what they wanted in elections, they wanted to uh to get all uh, all those uh, ballot papers. You know, because the ballot papers had the exact information that the, the country wanted to know. Yeah? Mm-hmm. But uh state the state, uh, what they did uh, is to just classificate every blood paper from any agent that did subscribe to the NUP. Now, for me, uh, I was in, I was deployed somewhere in Kampala, of which I do not want to, uh, to, to disclose where I was at, but still, where I was. Uh, the same thing that happened to my polling station were well, the same things that happened to every polling station in Uganda. People were being arrested. Mm-hmm. Ugandans who subscribed to the NUP were being arrested. Broad daylight. Even uh, a lot of Ugandans who were polling agents for the national platform were also being arrested after the elections were concluded. So uh, this is the same thing that we are still experiencing as Ugandans who are trying to fight for a peaceful Ugandan and a democratic Ugandan. Next, I spoke with Andrew Mwenda, a radio, print, and television journalist and the founder and owner of Independent Magazine, a newspaper which covered the turbulent Ugandan election season. He has been named a Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum in 2008 and a Top 100 Global Thinker by Foreign Policy magazine in 2010. 
The following year, he was nominated to serve on the Presidential Advisory Council of Paul Kagame, the current president of Rwanda. I was curious about the realities of reporting on election violence in Uganda. What challenges do journalists face with their work? I also wanted to learn about the internet blackout that characterized the 2021 general election. The blackout occurred the day before the election and was lifted over 100 hours later. The incumbent government claimed that the blackout was to prevent foreign interference in electoral affairs, while the opposition alleged that the blackout made it impossible to communicate with polling stations and share evidence of electoral violence. During the 2011 elections, SMS was blocked, and in 2016, social media and electronic money transfers. NetBlocks, an internet freedom and digital governance monitoring system, estimated that the near five-day internet block cost the Ugandan economy roughly nine billion U.S. dollars. Well, my name is uh, Andrew Mujuni Mwenda. I am a founder and managing director of Independent Publications Limited, the publishers of the independent newspaper, which is a news magazine, which is uh, the largest circulating news magazine in the East African region. Now, how has journalism been affected by Uganda's relatively young population? Well, uh, if you ask me, the biggest challenges are challenges of finding highly skilled and experienced reporters to work with you because we are we are a very young country. Just imagine the average Ugandan is 16 years old. Mm. We, are, we have one of the youngest populations in the world. So the median age is 16 years. And uh, to find, I am uh, 50 years old now, but I'm the oldest journalist in the whole country at 50. If you come to Canada there, the oldest journalist is 80 years. Mm. The youngest is 40. In Uganda, it's the other opposite. Most journalists are in their 20s. So <clears throat> the biggest challenge is to find mature, experienced, well-read and skilled journalists. Most people in the Western world will be focused on uh, the threats to press freedom by the government. I don't take that seriously. I think it's an excuse because each time the government attacks us, we achieve a lot of publicity and it promotes our work. I always think that the government interference in the media is like shooting yourself in the foot. There is nothing better at marketing the name of journalists and the name of newspapers than uh, government repression. So I consider that an advantage, not a disadvantage. But the big, if you ask me, the weakness is uh, to find a journalist with the kind of skills and experience to do a good and powerful story, who have cultivated sources deep inside the state and the private sector, deep inside the diplomatic core, and to tell the story from the inside. That's the most difficult thing. Even to find a journalist who can do well-balanced and insightful analysis of contemporary issues is not easy. What was your experience with the media blackout that took place leading up to the election? I will tell you first two things. One, although there was a, a shutdown, the shutdown, 4.5 million Ugandans downloaded VPN within a, the first day or two. Mm-hmm. So essentially, many people did by, bypass the ban right. by accessing social media via VPN. Essentially, the government of Uganda is Jurassic, meaning it lives in the Jurassic age. The, the land of Pangaea, 600 million, million years ago when dinosaurs ruled, ruled the world. That's what they're doing, 600 million years. In the modern day and age, we shut down the internet. Government, in fact, the shutdown of the internet was a reflection of the fact that the government did not understand that they could use the internet, the same social media, much more effectively than the opposition to promote their cause. So the first cause was the failure of government to understand the power of social media and develop a strategy to exploit the platforms of social, on social media for its own benefit. How effective did you find the media ban? They didn't achieve much of what they ne- intended to achieve because many people shifted who wanted news and, dev- and downloaded the VPNs and they could bypass the ban. And three, it also meant that the government was not a key player on social media platforms because it was burying its head in the sun, think it has shut it down, and therefore, those who wanted to communicate, continue to communicate regardless. Now, Pius, how would you describe the media blackout? Every, every and every and every social media platform was shut down completely. Yeah? Uh, Ugandans couldn't post anything about elections of this country. 
Ugandans couldn't post anything about any update of the election that that's going on in every part of the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you speak about the media shutdown, trust me, uh, these things happened and we saw them. But a very few Ugandans happened. To, uh, a few Ugandans who had access uh, f uh, from people from diaspora who had their social media platforms, they were, they were updating them to post on social media so that the world should see what is happening in the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But for them, whom who, uh, the, the people who are in, so the people who were in the country by that, by that time uh, had access to SMS. Yeah. So they could, uh, they could send uh, an SMS to the people in diaspora, yeah, to post on their social media platforms any update. But Ugandans who are who are in the country by that time didn't have any access to the internet. It was a total blackout to everyone who was in the country. Lastly, I spoke with Yasin Kakande, an author, migrant activist, international journalist, and TED fellow from Uganda. I was interested in hearing more about the gendered realities of election violence. This nuanced area of violence is often overlooked, and Yasin Kakande sheds light on this issue by reporting on women's rights groups who are monitoring trends in domestic violence and other forms of abuse in the lead-up to the 2016 general election. His article explores how women are subject to more psychological violence, which in turn prevents and discourages them from voting. In 2021, the European Union approved a grant of 1.1 million euros to support the Women's International Peace Center, who are leading a project called the Women's Situation Room. The project is jointly funded by the United Nations Development Fund, the United Nations Women, and the European Union in order to provide an effective response mechanism to threats of violence during the election season. Could you tell me a little bit about your 2016 articles on organizations who are monitoring gender violence around election season? Yes. Uh, okay, I published that story in for Thomson Reuters. It was in 2016, the elections before, because uh, uh, the previous elections, uh, I was in the United States already. I wasn't in Uganda. So... I published the, I think they published the first piece when they hold, when they started this uh, uh, experience of trying to monitor the election violence. And the perspective was that uh, women could monitor violence against women in elections more swiftly and even more better than men. So this is situation room. They were making a situation room for monitoring elections, uh, most election violence. And I remember in the press conference, uh, a couple of women activists uh, who attended, they always exposed so much this, this area, how elections bring along violence, especially about women, and it's never discussed, and it's always swept under the rug. So they, this experience, they said it was not the first experience. It was not starting in Uganda, actually. It had been done in Senegal and I think another African country, and the they were confident that it would bring more scrutiny and more exposure to atrocities that are done to women, especially in the elections. Now, how is this violence categorized? Their focus was they categorized the violence against women during elections into two types. The one which was like a family level where maybe husbands disagree with the women with the on the presidential candidate or any political candidate or political ideas and then it ends up in violence and the other one was mostly about uh, the government itself 
the government torturing women during elections. You know, one funny thing is that uh, governments, especially in Africa, they look at uh, elections as another kind of war. So whenever they are going, whenever we're going to elections, it's like for them, they are going to war because they have to put all their energy and they would use so much excessive force to make sure that they stay in power. So anything that tries to obstruct their stay in power is going to be met with excessive force. And sometimes a lot of murders and whatever that's that are done by the government. So they were also looking at uh, the perspective of government responding to political can female political candidates, you know, which are mostly in the opposition. There have been opposition female leaders who have been manhandled by the government, who for mostly their ideas or for mostly being on the opposition side and just to threaten other women not to try to come out to be, be against the government. You say it's important to look at election violence from a gendered perspective, um, not only in the Ugandan case, but rather when evaluating patterns of violence in general. Uh, yes, I think it's very important because, first of all, I most uh, African dictators, especially the ones in Uganda that I know so well, they always, when they look at elections as war, as I said earlier, and whenever they are fighting wars, they always resort to women bodies. They always make sure that they use women bodies in their wars and violating women and all these things. So it is the story that is so touching. In all these areas where they have worked, the Ugandan army, there has been so much violence on women. So women have been at the center of this violence. Yasin, what would you say are your hopes for the future of elections in Uganda? I think uh, elections in Af countries like Africa, to make sense, we have to... The most important thing is we have to address the European and the American imperialism. We need to ask them to stop enabling these dictators. If these 54 people were killed anywhere, like even if it's only four people were killed anywhere in any elections, no, they would not call them free and fair elections. This stance of calling the Ugandan elections after killing 54 people that have been reported was an utter disregard of the human life of the Ugandan people. It really sustains this government is the military aid. This is the government that survives with the military. It's only because of the military. It's only because of the military that he stays there. And who finds the military? The United States of America funds the Ugandan military. These are our stories. These are our struggles. We need to tell our own stories. Uh, we shouldn't always be waiting for them to come and tell our stories for us. Thank you for listening to this episode of Human Rights Magazine. The podcast is brought to you by the Upstream Journal. I invite you to consider supporting the program and the magazine with a contribution through PayPal as you explore other episodes.